Our next guest is getting a lot of attention as a writer and performer. You know, when people talk about your career, they talk about these ups and then the downs. Man, I don't know what the downs have been. I am the smartest man alive! I drafted off of his enthusiasm and energy. It's Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler. We're here with Adam Sandler. A big part of every kid's personality in the late 90s and early 2000s was quoting films like Billy Madison, Today, Junior! Happy Gilmore, The Price is Wrong, Big Daddy, Will somebody get the kid a Happy Meal? And of course, The Water Boy, Gatorade, H2O. But there were also those aside from Adam Sandler who seemed to be having their own renaissance. David Spade had his classic Joe Dirt. If I told you you had a beautiful body, would you hold it against me? Sure would. Rob Schneider, his Deuce Bigelow. Yet these films, released simultaneously within the Sandler era, felt incredibly familiar. What I didn't realize at the time was that some of the most popular films of that entire decade all led back to one man. You eat pieces of shit for breakfast? No. I award you no points and may God have mercy on your soul. Needle dick! Needle dick! You're gonna die, Trout! He has a five-year plan. What is it? Don't die? For a lot of us, Judd Apatow was our introduction to the underdog lead. I think people like people who are struggling in a movie. Like right. I like, you know, the Bourne identity. I like Matt Damon, but I would like it more if it starred Norm from Cheers, you know? Right. I mean, <laughs> a man who would regularly cast the same familiar faces throughout most of his films. Individuals who all seem to differ from the conventional norm. But before Apatow became Apatow, there was a man who'd break the stereotype of the typical Hollywood leading role. I was very driven, man. I don't I don't know what the hell was going through my head. Adam Sandler wasn't just interested in telling stories. See, at the core of most of his films was an underachiever. This court is after the truth, not the opinion of the defendant's father. My son is a moron. I withdraw my objection. Please proceed. These characters of his were certainly flawed and at times overly aggressive, but oddly enough, also incredibly likable. <laughs> Good, no more crying. Are you okay, man? Next time, kill me. Sandler seemed to have his finger on the pulse of both what the average person, everybody my age pees their pants, it's the coolest, and what the average problems were like. To give this young man custody over another life, it's insane. At the surface, they seem difficult to relate to, be it a grown man repeating grade school to inherit a hotel empire, couch. Or a former hockey player turned professional golfer who was now competing in the big leagues. Yet at their core, there was often more meaningful themes. While Billy Madison is a tale of personal growth and responsibility, it took the time to poke fun at the institutions it highlighted. The absurdity of repeating all of school within such an incredibly short time. Billy, if you spell this correctly, you pass second grade. Bypassing typical education restrictions is the sort of luxury only reserved for the ultra rich. In Happy Gilmore, he was not only on a path towards personal redemption, but playing to save his grandmother mother's house. You can't just take her stuff, she's too old! A more meaningful reasoning as opposed to golfers like Shooter McGavin who played only for money and fame. While there was often a deeper theme behind the manic or slapstick characters. Nice parenting. Hey, thanks. Are you my therapist? Take a walk. Critics couldn't possibly care less. I mean, every Sandler film just got absolutely torn to shreds. Sandler, understandably, had trouble coming to terms with the negativity. You start checking everything you're saying and thinking. The this overwhelming amount of bad press would cause him to doubt his own creative process. You know, when we were writing the next one, we were very uh, like, they're gonna hate this if we do this, and then we started saying, what's the difference? Yeah, it's not man? healthy. But while he certainly wasn't making fans out of the critics, he was building a massive cult following among the general public. Adam Sandler! That was good. <laughs> Despite the massive success and his new status among the stars, he still felt like he was one of us. He favors oversized clothes, untied sneakers. Perhaps this ability to resonate with the average person stems from an average beginning. My mother said how great I was all the time. I started to believe her. But my father would be <laughs> like, you're great, but you ain't that great. His father would be foundational to the man he is today. But his older brother would provide just that little extra push he needed. My brother said to me when I was applying for college, 
colleges. I said, what should I study? He goes, why don't you be a, an actor? You should be a comedian. I said, yeah, 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 I'll do that. That was kind of that stupid. And so he would. He'd graduate with a degree in fine arts in 1988, all the while having been honing his skills on the comedy stage. Will Chamberlain scored 100 points in one basketball game. Here's my impression of the coach on the other team. Uh, Who's covering Wilkes? <laughs> Internalizing the habits of comedic heroes like Rodney Dangerfield, Steve Martin, and Eddie Murphy. After a night on stage, his sharpened comedic presence would catch the attention of Dennis Miller, who would then recommend him to SNL producer Lauren Michaels. What would follow would be a position alongside arguably the greatest SNL cast ever put together. You know the poem I turned in? Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. <laughs> David Spade, Chris Farley, Dana Carvey, Tim Meadows, Molly Shannon, and of course the late great Phil Hartman to name a few. He'd spent five years amongst comedic royalty. However, in 1995, and alongside Chris Farley, he'd be fired from the show. When I saw Farley, he said, me too, they don't want me either. We were both like, F this shit. We got mad together, pretended we weren't sad, and pretended this was, was for the best. Sandler was understandably bitter. The dream of damn near every 90s comedian was to have a spot on SNL. Fortunately for Sandler, his time at SNL had helped generate a loyal fan base. I, I realized what Saturday Night Live did for me. As well as introduce him to a number of comedians and actors who not only had become his close personal friends, but would collaborate extensively alongside him in the films to come. Films that, at the time, all carried his own personal touch. If he wasn't belting his own creative tunes, Oh, hot, want to touch the hiney? He was throwing in celebrity cameos. Even women are possessions to him. See, yeah. Billy Idol gets it. I don't know why she doesn't get it. Recurring bits. O'Doyle rules. <laughs> Thanks a lot, O'Doyle. Nice meeting you. Or helping build the careers of his close personal friends. The only reason I got made because Adam Adam decided to make it. He said, just leave me alone. I'll oh. make something. Just stop Adam calling. was the guy who uh, okayed it. <laughs> he produced it. Friends like Peter Dante, Steve Buscemi, Alan Covert, and Rob Schneider. But something was missing. Adam Sandler had no trouble pulling the strings and helping his friends land supporting roles before because, well, he was Adam Sandler. Never in my entire career phoned one thing in. An unconventional leading man with tremendous this mass appeal can make a lot of demands. But when it came time for his friends to receive their fair share of the limelight, production companies would begin getting cold feet. He had a choice to make, either continue raking in millions as a leading man and have his friends watch from the sidelines, or take matters into his own hands. I guess we could sum up this movie by saying produced by Adam Sandler. Technically he's your boss. We were basically peers until he blew by me on a rocket ship. It's uh, good to have a, uh, actually a boss that's funny. What resulted was the creation of Happy Madison Productions in 1999. Its first film would see Rob Schneider in the lead role of Deuce Bigelow. Okay, I quit. You ungrateful he bitch. This unsurprisingly would find significant box office success. What the critics couldn't understand was that Sandler had this formula down to a science. What followed was David Spade in Joe Dirt, which is now an incredibly quotable cult classic. You're gonna stand there owning a fireworks stand and tell me you don't have no whistling bungholes? And Dana Carvey in The Master of Disguise. Am I not turtly enough for the turtle club? Adam Sandler was not only giving his close personal friends consistent and stable work, but helping them find their own box office success. I mean, you couldn't escape Rob Schneider at the turn of the new millennium. In America, they don't allow smoking in aquariums. When in Europe, we don't unilaterally attack a country just to steal their oil. Joe Dirt is still a regular part of the millennial vocabulary. Why don't you talk into the microphone? I got a backup mic right here. Check one, two. Testing, testing. Even better was that he was able to juggle multiple projects at once, taking whatever creative freedom he wanted along the way. As a result, you had one of the most successful box office runs of any production company in that entire era. But while there was certainly no shortage of funding, Adam Sandler was getting older now, and the appeal of a slapstick, almost aggressive man-child was slowly waning. He diverged from the typical route in Paul Thomas Anderson's Punch Drunk Love. The main impetus was wanting to write something for Adam. I wanted to ask you something because you're a doctor, right? Yeah. I don't like myself sometimes. Barry, I'm a dentist. You know he's box office. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately for Sandler, the critics this time around were a lot less harsh. He'd shown he was certainly capable of a performance that warranted much more depth. However, they weren't exactly the sort of films he wanted to make. He'd follow this up with films like Fifty First Dates. Is it something that I can help you with? No, no, no. I just can't read. The Longest Yard, and Click. Films that the critics absolutely hated, yet audiences would find incredibly endearing. He was back into his old routine, his old formula. That's the thing though, Adam Sandler's talent lied in what some would call comfort movies. He most certainly had the range, damn near all critics would be silenced with his unexpected 2019 performance in Uncut Gems. That's history right there, you understand? How many carrots is this? Good what, four, five thousand? But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Now picture this, you have dozens of lifelong friendships, people who you not only collaborate with, but you're also foundational to their careers. The film's doing great, it made, it made a huge uh, amount yeah. of money last week. We broke like uh, three box office records. You're best friends with Adam. Yeah. You guys went to college together. Yeah. You've built a fan base that is not only interested in your stories, but deeply cares about the man behind the films. While he's not exactly Coppola or Kubrick, and these themes are fairly surface level, there's a widespread appeal here for a reason. He knows that most of us just want something familiar. Stories we can resonate with, made by people who are not only having the absolute time of their life creating them. And I always want to do stuff with these guys. He always buys me dinner, you know. He's just a nice guy and his wallet's about 10 feet tall. But are incredibly proud of the work they do. Adam's comedy doesn't preach or instruct. He's down in the muck with us. The guys that you came up with, they're either writing or directing or producing or acting in your films. I love you, Adam. I love you, buddy. Nobody makes me laugh like you, and nobody has taken better care of me in this business than you. 